Well, hello and welcome again to another podcast. I am again with Andy. How are Hi, you? Hi, Paul. I'm good. Good, good, good. good. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm back. Um, <laughs> another holiday to Iceland. Another one, another one. So, did the volcano erupt? Well, the volcano was in full flow. We were literally 200 meters from this uh, erupting volcano and about one meter from the lava field. Got some epic, epic uh, video and drone footage, so it was uh, really, really cool. Where, where can we see this epic drone footage? Um, if you go on to juliansimpson.js, I'll put that here, you can find some cool posts about uh, the erupting volcano. And as it's one of the few places that you seem to be to travel to during this COVID time, even if you're from the UK, I believe, especially if you've had both injections uh, for, against COVID, then why not? It's a cool place to visit. And when people go to see these videos, will they be able to see you crashing the drone into the apartment wall? Well, they may see how useless I am in general. Um, it's because my mind tends to be distracted with other things, Andy. You know, I'm a more of a thinker and I'm like, you know, elsewhere in my brain and simple things like joysticks and because you know. out of the last couple of trips, there have been a couple of Paul Simpson moments, haven't they? Like, <laughs> they get in the car, stuck in the desert in Dubai, yes. flying the drone into the wall inside an apartment, mm -hmm. and then sand in rotors or something? Yeah, we destroyed three drones <laughs> with the sand in the rotors. Yeah, it, it's generally just a disaster. But if you want a bit of a laugh, then yeah, follow, follow that. It's completely not skiing, <laughs> but you know, it's something else. Some good, some good footage of the volcano, by the way. Some good footage. Oh. So we are back, um, and as ever, we're going to make a quick cluster of podcasts while we're here. Um, we also are going to take the time sometime, I think Andy and I, just to, to troll through all the comments, because we get so many comments, and I, I really appreciate that people do take the time to write, um, and we will um, do our best to, to answer them and, and pick out some classic cool ones. Um, I would say to Andy that I noticed um, is skiing really that hard there was a video we put out and um tai chi skiing i see wrote um a comment andy about um direct to parallel hi gentlemen funny that ever since i've read one of your podcasts he tells us how good youtube analytics are and he's been pointed to us all the time and it then says skiing is easy but i think it's complicated by your Western teaching system, which starts by teaching wedge skiing, he or plow skiing, yeah. um, <coughs> wedge skiing. So yeah, wedge skiing, easy to learn and easy to show off. So the newbie learns fast, good for business. The most of them would get stuck later when they try going from a wedge to skiing parallel. That little plow or wedge may take a lifetime effort to break. The direct to parallel method is much more efficient system. I have taught a never ever newbie to parallel turn in three hours. And he then puts a link on it. As the video shows, newbies learn how to ski, not much to watch, but the proof is at the end of the video. Not saying that he learned parallel skiing, but he won't have had the problem to try and get rid of that ugly wedge. While try to reach the highest level is very hard but once they're there and he goes on anyway you can read the comment because basically he's a he's anti the wedge anti wedge man anti, anti wedge, wedge man. man which though so i did i did reply back in fairness to that comment just to explain that we would answer that one because both andy and i have a huge amount of experience with direct to parallel method of skiing oh don't we just <laughs> yeah so uh, it's yeah horses so um, sorry, Andy, you were saying? Um, I can't remember what I was about to say, but yeah, it's it's the direct to parallel skiing debate again. Um, yes. And as you said, we've got a fair, fair bit of experience in this as we did teach direct to parallel for many, many years. Um, yeah. And not it's simple. That we, not that we wanted to. <laughs> no. It's simple that the direct to parallel method is phenomenal, that it can take somebody from a to Z relatively fast and indeed in a private lesson I can remember having somebody skiing down a steep red by the end of the day quite comfortably in parallel 
But the issue was, was as fantastic as it was for one person, it can be an absolute disaster for another person. And if you're teaching a group of 10 people, it had that huge problem as a beginner in like, um, teaching a beginner's group. The, the group would split rapidly and mm -hmm. very rapidly. You'd have the young whippersnappers literally throwing themselves down the slopes, getting it straight away. And then some poor, you know, nothing against people but you know a little bit older a little bit stiffer a little bit more nervous yep, yep. grabbing like not knowing what to do because one of the issues with the direct parallel method was you are forbidden to teach them how to stop <laughs> you must avoid telling them how to stop for as long as possible because otherwise they'll grab onto the stopping action which tends to be at first a, a wedge of some sort yeah. Um, so it works and it can be fantastic, but it has its flaws like anything else. Yeah. As you say, you've got, you've got to have an element of balls about you to allow the skis to run to achieve the direct to parallel parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to say that when we, we were teaching it, we were teaching people on, was it 130 centimetre? 120. 120, 120 centimetre skis. So they were given a very short ski, which is a lot easier to perform on. Um, given the progression that we used. However, as you just said, we didn't teach them to stop, but we did go on to teach them a very rounded J turn to turn up the hill to stop. But some of the other issues is you can't do a parallel into a T-bar lift cube. <laughs> Yeah, you uh, just can't do it. Let, let's <laughs> look at it first and go back. Because some people might be going, what are these two talking about? Well, Basically, there is a, a generally an accepted system within associations that sees people take somebody from absolute beginner and progress through a range of activities and programs that take somebody to eventually a dynamic parallel skier. Now, that's the steps of this usually involve introductory activities where you're introducing people to equipment, the environment, and making sure that they know how to put their skis on and off, how to carry them. Then it's moving slowly to them sliding around, and eventually they start to do, at first, some form of plow or wedge to control speed and to give them some stability, almost like out outriggers on a bike, you know. Yeah, like, a wider base of support. Yeah. Now, when I was teaching in a, and I was lecturing in a conference to trainers, um, I was talking about the plow position as well a lot because from a biomechanics side where I come from, these internal rotation in the hip socket. So what's happening when you're skiing in a wedge is both left and right leg are internally rotating and in effect caving in the knees. And this normally would be seen as an extremely weak position and not a stable position from torque perspective in the human body. So it also did trick me. I mean, skiing anyway is a bit of a weird one because you have internal and external rotation in a parallel. But normally we only internally rotate in the hip socket, for example, when you're running and your foot's behind you, let's say you were boxing and your foot's behind you, or you mm -hmm. lunge, you do a lunge, yeah, your back basketball. foot is internally rotated. Mm -hmm. So it was always for me when I was learning the ski system, it was a question from a biomechanics side and physics side to say, this is not right, this is not a good idea. However, as we obviously, you know, develop in our career, we start to understand why associations may sell this as a product. And yeah, I mean, the guy says himself, oh, it's good for business. Um, because maybe people, you know, will learn to stand on their skis quicker in a plow position. You know, their center of mass remains in the base of support. Mm -hmm. Whereas a parallel requires you to cross your center of mass yeah. over the base of support. And therefore that's that trust element, like leaning a bike. You know, the faster you go, the more you lean the bike in. You don't just turn, turn, the, wheel, yeah. turn the wheel. The handlebars, yeah. Yeah. So I can see, you know, where you get this from. But what this um, guy, I think it's a guy, needs to understand is you need to be careful of just selling one way, one system and anything. Because we're going to come probably onto a podcast later on about this when we talk about fitness and skiing. But everybody's different, aren't they? And, you know, when you've got 10, 12 people in front of you, this direct parallel can become a nightmare. Yeah, as you said, they split very quickly. And more often than not, we would start on a Sunday uh, morning and by Sunday afternoon or by Monday morning, we would be splitting groups and bringing in a another teacher to take half of the group. Yeah. The faster half would obviously move on 
rapidly and the slower would, would stay behind. But And those slower ones, in fairness, those nervous ones who, who didn't get it, that almost screws their week up now because they've been half taught something and then they have to pedal back over almost yeah. to suddenly go into the traditional style of learning to ski yeah, again. Yeah, because at the end of the day, if, if it is they haven't got the, um, the nerve, which is one of the biggest barriers, then you've got to start teaching them to do a plow. Because the other problem then is, Andy, is plowing on those 120s doesn't work. No. So now they need to go on to a longer yeah. ski, which makes them think, why? Because you have to think, everybody, if you imagine I'm um, six feet tall, you know, two meters tall, and, but the ski's only one meter 20 under my feet, the, the base of support's now been severely shrunk compared to the height of the person. You've now got a really wobbly thing going on up here. Yeah. And that's why when people ski fast, you know, Super G and things like that downhill, they're on these 2 meter 20, 2 meter, they're on these huge planks because it provides a huge amount of forgiveness and stability. But it also means that edge is a lot longer um, and therefore for ploughing or wedging, the, the, you tend to then take people back off the 120s yeah, and on stick them onto ski. a bigger ski again. Yeah, the problem with the 120 is they, they, the minute they turned to their feet, the whole the whole ski was basically tips were touching each other. But it's quite interesting because we used to do it on the 120s. If they couldn't do it, we would give them a longer ski. In France, they had a method where every, every day, I think you moved up by five centimeters. Yeah. So on yeah. the first day of the holiday, you would have been on maybe a 120, then a 125, then a 130, a 130. And I think that approach is possibly, albeit that wasn't a direct parallel, that was a normal progression, or I say normal, the kind of progression we would teach, but the ski got bigger as the week went on. Because one of the other problems when we were teaching direct to parallel is, you'd have a group on the 120s they would learn to ski parallel in a week using that progression, but then they'll come back the next year, go into the ski hire and say, we've done a week of skiing. And they'll go, oh great, you need a 180 ski. And then they <laughs> don't know how to ski that ski because you can't just go from a direct to parallel progression with a 120 and then jump up to a 180. And what we used to, <laughs> we used to have problems as the teachers because we would spend a week on them 120s and then on the next Sunday, put our real skis on. And could we ski? No. <laughs> because it requires, if you imagine the old big feet things, you know, a lot of them mob, they don't like these big feet tail skis that are like 80 centimetres or something because they had a problem with twisting people's knees and yep. breaking legs and knees and all sorts because they didn't have a real binding on them. But they were cool to play around with. I mean, they're mm. hilarious. You can spin round, you can do, as you're flying down, you can do a 360 or 70, whatever. You can do all sorts with it. But as Andy says, all of a sudden when you go onto a long ski, you need patience to start turning it over. And this is why people get caught out when they're always skiing a slalom ski, for example, like about 160. And then suddenly they, they jump onto a 185 or something and think, oh, I'm going to pick up a longer ski. And all of a sudden they're falling inside all the time on the turn because they're, they're trying to move inside too fast too, now yeah, and they're just early. not being patient enough with the length of the ski and also a longer ski requires a little bit more speed you know that speed assists you to tip the ski over um, and that was the great thing obviously the short ski meant they could ski slower but that 120 ski does become a nightmare if you start getting onto steeper terrain because mm -hmm. that's where it starts to shake around it's you have to be perfectly centered to, to, to maintain yeah. it and of course the other problem was Andy was the edges were absolutely horrendous on the skis because the ski school thought it was clever not to service them yeah. in 11 years yeah I was gonna say that they were also very old skis weren't they yeah I mean they were 11 years old and they were still looked brand new and I, <laughs> the, the edge just looked it never looked as though it had been ground no. once and as a result uh, that was a, a bit of an issue but so look the argument is is that everything works for somebody somewhere um, and you know I can see why you're selling the direct to parallel side it, it, it can be phenomenal if you carefully choose the person but I wouldn't put for example nothing against the 65 year old woman or guy coming in and say let's do direct to parallel with him I would say hang on a second this is going to be not the right step for that person but some 14 year old kid or 20 year old lad who's a rugby player or whatever and yeah. gun ho it's a fantastic system great but you know it's horses for courses you need to choose the 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 the, the, the magic one that fits that 
person. And that's, that's the skill of the instructor, not just throwing one method at that person. And, and I think this is a good time to just say that takes us back to our previous video when we talked about why are not all teachers equal. Yeah. And if, if it was experience, only one... basically. It's, huh? So you have experience of making mistakes, seeing what works, seeing yeah. what doesn't work, and not just what works, what doesn't work, but what works for different characters and different mm -hmm. people, different body shapes, different, you know, different attitudes. You can almost tell as somebody's walking towards you as a beginner in their eyes, what's going to work for that person better and what's not. So please, no matter, you know, if I was talking about strength and conditioning coaching now or gymnastics or anything, I can tell you the one thing I learned as I got into my late 30s and into my 40s was stop following people and echoing systems that you find on YouTube or anywhere else in the world because you need to start developing your own experience, your own understanding of things and seeing from your life experience what is you know, the, the, the solution, what's the quickest method. And it isn't direct to parallel, it isn't either plow turning either. No. It's not. It's the one that's right. Yeah. So um, be aware of that and I think that from our side, um, Andy, there's not really much more to add about, about this, but um, except to say that, you know, these comments are fantastic. They yeah. really give us material to go through. Um, I know we're never going to agree. You know, Andy and I don't agree, and you're not going to agree with us. We're not here to be controversial like that. We're, we're just giving our opinion. Yeah, our thoughts. Our thoughts. And keep, keep it coming, as Paul says. Keep the comments coming, but also keep the questions coming, because we can base more videos around your questions to give you the content that you want. We know there is a plethora of content out there and from where I look at it, a lot of it is just people skiing for skiing's sake. We wanna give you um, a benefit of our wealth of knowledge and experience over many, many years, not just in skiing, as Paul refers to all the time, the fitness, the gymnastics, and from my point, other, other elements of getting you out on holiday from a travel organization point of view. So keep it coming, it's great stuff. All right, well that's it from us and we'll see you next time on our podcast. Bye see you now. soon, bye. Uh, Andy, I didn't press record. <laughs> oh, you're joking me, man. <laughs> Julian, that's the cell shouting.